Angry protests across Israel force Benjamin Netanyahu to delay controversial changes. But he declares he'll still push ahead with the judicial overhaul. But what does this mean for his government coalition and for Israel? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Nastasia Tay. Now, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced a delay to his controversial judicial overhaul after major protests across Israel on Monday. He said he had taken that step to prevent a rift in the nation. Thousands of Israelis took to the streets following news that Netanyahu had fired his defense minister, Yoav Gallant, who'd spoken out against his plans to change the judicial system. Natasha Ghanem reports now from West Jerusalem. In the face of protests growing by the day. A reversal by a prime minister not known for compromise. From a national responsibility, from the will to avoid the rift within the people, I decided to suspend the second and third reading from the law in this Knesset tenure in order to give time to get to a broad consensus to pass the legislation during the next Knesset. Benjamin Netanyahu gave way as the country faced growing paralysis, with a nationwide strike closing airports, schools, banks and businesses. Tens of thousands filled the streets to voice their frustrations. We're fighting for this, for this attempt to overthrow the judiciary and take control by the politician will be thrown away from the table. And we're also asking that Benjamin Netanyahu will resign and take responsibility for what he has done to this country. But Netanyahu's delay came with a price. Hardline National Security Minister Itamar Ben Gavir said his party only agreed to the delay in exchange for the formation of a new National Guard under the command of Ben Gavir's office. There were divisions within the ruling coalition. Some called for uniting behind Netanyahu to halt the judicial overhaul and defuse the crisis. Others dug in, saying they would not surrender to violent anarchy and the tyranny of the minority. The far-right governing coalition and supporters say they will not have the vote or the state stolen from them. I, I think it is a tremendous mistake to stop the reform. However, I can understand because of the heat of the moment and the fighting that's going on, he has to make a calculated decision. But, but, the reform is an absolute necessity for this country to continue in a democratic fashion. Left unresolved, the post of defense minister. It was Netanyahu's firing of Yoav Gallant on Sunday that brought the crisis to a head. As of Monday evening, Gallant had not received a formal dismissal letter. Netanyahu has 48 hours to name a successor. Natasha Ghanem, Al Jazeera, West Jerusalem. Oh, well, let's bring in our three guests. From Tel Aviv, we have Yaniv Segal. He is the head of the Pink Front. That's an Israeli protest movement calling for the resignation of the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. From Washington, D.C., we have Elisa Pavia. She is Associate Director for Middle East Programs at the Atlantic Council. And from West Jerusalem, Jeremy Sultan, an Israeli political analyst and also a former Knesset faction director for the Yamina Party. A warm welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us on Inside Story. Now, we've been watching the situation, obviously, very closely here on Al Jazeera, and there were times on Monday where it really felt, amid all the chaos, that Netanyahu's political future could be hanging in the balance. I'm interested to know, because we now see the majority of the strike action being called off. He's still hanging in there, and the coalition is still intact. Jeremy, how did he do it? Well, we know that Netanyahu is the chess uh, grandmaster when it comes to politics. He always seems to find a way out of whatever trouble it might seem that he's in. He had to move in a way in which, on one side, he did not lose the right flank of his own coalition, and then on the other side, be able to say enough and do enough in order to convince enough members of the opposition to listen to President Herzog's plea to come and try to negotiate in the president's residence. 
And once again, Netanyahu was somehow able to pull another rabbit out of the hat. You say do enough for different politicians. I am curious about how it was enough for the protest movement, because the judicial overhaul hasn't been scrapped. It's just been delayed. And given the amount of pressure that the politicians were under, uh, Yaniv, do you think that perhaps the, the people who are on the streets could have pushed for more? I think that uh, maybe it's the last rabbit that Netanyahu has in his hat. It's, it doesn't work. I mean, I, we are all the protests, uh, all the protest movement are now um, declaring that we are not going to stop. We know Netanyahu. Everyone calls him a liar. Even his allies know he's a liar. We know it too well for the past 12 years of his regime, and we are not going to believe it. We know that he's trying just to, to make the protest disappear. But yesterday and the day before, we saw something that we have never seen in Israel before. And what happened yesterday is backing up is a huge victory for us. Not, it's not the end of, the, of this struggle on the, the uh, democracy of Israel, but it is a huge victory against someone that, as you described, is, seems to be a magician, but he's ran out of tricks. Well, we are also seeing overtures from the U.S. I see Biden's, Biden's administration has offered a carrot of sorts to Netanyahu. They hadn't invited him to Washington, D.C., but he is now ostensibly going to visit the White House in the coming months. It's still unscheduled, and this all after the delay that he's now announced. Lisa, how much sway does Washington hold right now? Washington has, um, as always, an incredible amount of sway. I mean, the U.S. is um, one of Israel's most important allies, if not Israel's most important ally in the world. And President Biden has reiterated time and time again to Benjamin Netanyahu that he will not with withstand any um, overhaul to democratic uh, principles because democracy, as President Biden has said, is, is a hallmark to U.S.-Israel relationship. Um, he said that in his um, private phone call to Benjamin Netanyahu on March 19. Um, and he's reiterated this yesterday when he welcomed Netanyahu's uh, proposition to um, uh, push aside for a few months the judicial overhaul, because he did state, again, that democracies are strengthened by genuine checks and balances. And so uh, President Biden has made, has made this very, very clear to Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, clearly, pressure building from the U.S., but also pressure been, has been building within Israel for, for many, many months now. It feels like everything really came to a head on Monday after all these months of street protests. Uh, Jeremy, was it Defense Minister Yoav Gallant's dismissal that really pushed people over the edge? Well, you know, we can definitely look at that as, as the catalyst, but this is... We have to look at this from the beginning, uh, from the formation of the government, already the first meeting of the Constitution Committee, here um, in the in Jerusalem, in the Israeli Knesset, was focused on the judicial reform. And already from the start, you saw that there were protesters taking to the streets. And frankly, I think that most people were surprised, both in the coalition and the opposition, in terms of the intensity, the determination, and the dedication of the protesters. We're talking about a movement that's been going now for close to three months strong. Just looking at yesterday's protest, which lasted about 12 hours, I mean, those are things that definitely, in terms of public opinion, they make a huge difference. So for sure, we can look at other um, uh, aspects of, throughout the timeline in terms of specific votes, specific timing, in terms of when various aspects were advanced. And of course, the uh, announcement of the dismissal of the defense minister, which has not yet actually taken uh, effect, which in itself is a little bit of a peculiar type of situation. But it's just a collection of, of uh, factors that ended up, you know, coming to a head yesterday to the point where, frankly, it would have been a surprise had Prime Minister Netanyahu not called to put a pause mm -hmm. and stop current legislation from moving forward. And the question became how he could do, like I said beforehand, enough to be able to bring the two large parties of the opposition led by um, opposition leader Lapid and Benny Gantz, and he was able to provide enough for both of them to be willing to go to the president's residence, mm -hmm. while on the other side, be able to do enough to keep his coalition partners 
and maintain his coalition moving forward. You mentioned just how peculiar the whole case of Gallant was. I want to take a little bit of a look as, at what was behind that, because Gallant spoke out of his, about his opposition to the judicial overhaul, partly because he felt that many reservists, huge numbers of reservists, were actually refusing to serve in the military. Now, Elisa, I know that the U.S. was pleased about Gallant's appointment as defence minister. Do you have a sense of potentially what's next for him in this very strange scenario or, or who might be his replacement? Well, it's difficult to say. Um, it's important to reiterate also that Gallant was actually not opposed to the judicial overhaul, uh, first, firstly, but he only opposed it in a second sense when he realized uh, what it could do to Israel's security, as, Lee, as you rightly pointed out. Um, uh, once he saw that huge amounts of the reservists were um, going to strike and not serve in the IDF, he realized how um, um, the effects that that could have on Israel's security. Um, and this is incredibly important also to the United States, because we've also seen how uh, President Biden has called uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to strengthen its um, uh, support to civil society and to the IDF. And so whether or not um, we will continue seeing an appointment of Gallant remains to be seen. But what we need to remember is that he was um, firstly opposed, um, not opposed to the judicial overhaul. And then he um, realized that it would become a significant security threat to the, to the country. Mm. Well, when you start seeing forces within the military turn against the prime minister, you really understand just how widespread the opposition to this is. Uh, Yaniv, you helped to found the protest movement that you were a part of back in 2020. Obviously, a lot's changed since then. Just how diverse is the crowd that you're seeing in the streets now? First of all, 2020 was our first victory against Netanyahu. Back then, we already saw what power we have as citizens in Israel and how much we are against uh, corruptions, uh, corruption in, gov in government, against, um, I can't say another word, Jewish fascism that we see now. Uh, inside the government, and I want just to, so it will be clear, the true opposition to Netanyahu is not the opposition that we see in the Knesset, is in the streets. We are the opposition. I mean, nothing that Lapid or Gantz or, Gantz or anyone else would say can just stop the, the protest. Even I, I can't stop it. No one can stop it. As you saw on Sunday evening, it was a spontaneous um, uh, demonstration, not like all the others that we saw the past 12 uh, months, uh, weeks, sorry, that we called, we sent the messages, we said that in a few days we're going to Kaplan. No, I was at home on the couch preparing, like, to have dinner with my boyfriend, and then, like, people said, go out now. And just the street were filled with people I've never seen something like that. Mm. This is the true power. This is the true opposition to Netanyahu, because we think that Lapid and Gantz, they are not. They are, I, I personally think that they are waiting just to jump back to Netanyahu's arms, although Gantz should know better after being tricked by Netanyahu in the rotation uh, trick that he did him uh, some time ago. So we are the true opposition to Netanyahu. Uh, Yaniv, you say that what happened on Monday was spontaneous, but there had been previous planned protests. A lot of this has really been driven by the grassroots, but I see that there is a group calling itself the Struggle HQ. How is the grassroots movement organizing going forward? Actually, it's not that organized. I mean, there's a lot of organi organizations. There is the head headquarters, and we are all talking. Actually, w we should understand. It's people from all the rainbow, the political rainbow of Israel, Right, left, uh, Jewish, more say, like uh, Jewish religious, secular Jews, all that together, different groups, doctors, psychologists, army, everyone together knows that all the other goals that we have for Israel need to be postponed in order to defend the democratic, uh, the, the Israel democracy. So we are now, actually, we prepared a big demonstration for today. But what happened to the past two days make us today to take a small pause, to mm -hmm. rethink ourselves. But one thing is certain, in all the groups and all the discussions, we are not stopping. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Well, right at this moment seems to be a good time to take the temperature of public opinion in Israel. Obviously, there's a huge amount of anger. Most of it's directed at the coalition government, a lot of far-right ultranationalist parties. 
But this is a government that resulted from an election with people voting for who they actually wanted to. And I know there's been a lot of discussion of a, a normalization, so to speak, of the far right in politics. Jeremy, I know you do a bit of polling. Is that what you're seeing? Look, uh, right now, if we're looking at the polls from the last 24 hours, we see really the coalition uh, just as a whole, all of the parties across the board taking a hit. Um, uh, we're looking at overall situation of the coalition, which right now has 64 of 120 seats, losing about 10 seats in average. That puts them under the majority. Um, so that's a very, very big hit. Uh, I'll say that the surge in terms of where we're seeing those votes go, uh, they're going to Benny Gantz, one of the opposition leaders, uh, the one who said before Lapid that he wanted to move forward with talking dialogue with the coalition. So again, if I'm looking at the numbers, it seems to be that most Israelis, I guess, like most countries, are in the middle, and uh, they might not necessarily be very happy with the way the coalition has been handling it, but they don't seem to be so happy in terms of what the opposition has been doing, and they're looking for some other voice. Uh, one of the things that we've been seeing a lot right now behind the scenes in private polling is scenario polls. What happens if this personality splits off and creates a new party? What happens if the next superstar, savior, messiah comes either out of retirement or out of a different area and then starts a new party? So those are the type of things we're seeing right now in the polling. Very interesting times. At this point, I want to take a look at some of the major figures in Netanyahu's coalition. Now, Israel's coalition government consists of Netanyahu's Likud party, two ultra-Orthodox parties, and three far-right religious factions. Bezalel Smotrich is the finance minister. He's a settler, and he oversees the civil administration that approves settlement building in the occupied West Bank and also controls important aspects of Palestinians' lives. Itamar Ben-Gavir is the security minister. He's also another settler and an ultra-nationalist politician who has been convicted of racism. And Orit Strzok is the National Missions Minister. She's a member of the far-right religious Zionism party. She's known for her support of illegal settlements and anti-LGBTQ views. Now, I'm wondering about where this goes within the coalition, because the push for the judicial overhaul that we saw came from a lot of these people within the coalition. Do you think, Jeremy, that the coalition will hold up over Passover? Yes. I, I mean, if we're looking at the current political struggle in terms of Netanyahu, the Knesset's supposed to go into recess after the Sunday session. Um, by going ahead and having the opposition parties, the large ones, agree to a dialogue with the president's residence that will take him throughout the rest of this week and to the beginning of next week. And um, it'll take him again into the, into the recess where the parliament will be uh, on break. And with the parliament break the parliamentary system that we have, there is no actual way to topple the government. And that sort of gives him time to regroup, rethink, put up a new strategy. And then when he comes back in the month of May, we'll have to see what type of Netanyahu we see, what the actual plan is in terms of the coalition moving forward, and also where the opposition is. Did they feel that they mm -hmm. got what they wanted out of the talk with the president? Or do they feel that uh, Netanyahu did not go ahead and provide the goods they were hoping to get from him? And then, of course, we'll probably have a conversation then in terms of what happens at that point. It does feel in the meantime, though, that there's already been a bit of wheeling and dealing happening within the coalition. I see there's now a plan to create a, a national guard under Ben Gavir's control. Uh, Elisa, are there concerns about that, especially given his history? Absolutely. Um... Ben Gvir is, is a, a convicted felon, um, and he was accused by Israeli courts of supporting terrorists. He's also known for having a portrait of uh, Baruch Goldstein um, in his house, who is a terrorist who's um, killed 29 Palestinians. So um, giving him a power over a National Guard is incredibly worrying to many people who see this as a threat to um, Israel's democracy, because once you hand over um, a, the this sort of power to someone like Ben Gvir, um, you really threaten the security within the population, and you really threaten um, the social cohesion within the population, because people do not veer, uh, do not view Ben Gvir positively. 
Um, and yesterday, we've seen time and time again from Netanyahu and from Herzog and from President Herzog before then, um, that there is a legitimate fear of an outbreak of violence and a civil war. And so handing over to someone like Ben Gvir, his own National Guard, um, is only and going to increase those fears, especially amongst the, the protesters and the population who um, are scared of a national crackdown um, onto the protesters. You mentioned the phrase civil war there. Are there broader concerns around security, especially given Israel's nuclear arsenal, Elisa? Well, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I think the main security, uh, the main challenge here is really trying to um, appease all parties involved. Um, and especially yesterday, we saw how the general population um, is strong and vibrant and can take to the streets and uh, bring Israel to a complete standstill. Um, and so during yesterday's protest as well, we also saw uh, ben Gvir and Smotrich um, and Netanyahu calling for um, their, their um, loyalists to take to the streets against the protesters. And so that really hmm. um, evoked fear of a civil war. And that is why when Benjamin Netanyahu um, went on camera, um, really stressed the importance of avoiding that. Uh, Yaniv, I want to bring you in here because I could see you wanted to, to jump in. Are there worries that you might see confrontations on the streets? Yeah. The, it's not war. We saw yesterday we were attacked by angry mob. I can't say any other word because yesterday our activists were uh, attacked in Jerusalem after finishing the demonstration that started in the Knesset. We finished it um, near the residency in uh, Aza Street and Balfu, and then uh, we started going back to the train to go to Tel Aviv to continue in Kaplan, and we were attacked uh, by in, aggressively. Uh, some people needed medical uh, treatment, and so what you're talking about, we see it already. And the personal militias, uh, the armed forces for Ben Gvir, which we don't know if they may or may not, he may or may not get it, but it's a direct threat on us. Hmm. For now, we, even though we treated sometimes aggressively by the police, we still trust the police and the army, but we won't trust um, personal forces of Ben Gvir because it's a direct threat on our life by our prime minister. And we should say it, Ben Gvir took the symbol of the car of Rabin a month before he was assassinated after a toxic propaganda by Netanyahu in 1994 prior to the assassination of, of uh, Yitzhak Rabin. So it's the same, it's violence that we already saw, it's a machine working that already worked effectively and now it's being um, aimed on us in the streets. We feel it already, we are afraid, and we are Yanif, not going to let that happen. Yanif, I want to pick up on something that you said there. You used the word trust, and obviously a huge amount of what's, how it's going to play out in the coming weeks and months comes down to trust. I see there have been some moves, quietly, seemingly, to put into place some procedural measures to make it quicker to vote the judicial overhaul through in Parliament in the future. Is that potentially being viewed as disingenuous by the protesters? We really have an emergency of trust. We don't trust the government. We don't trust our representative in the Knesset. We don't trust them. We don't trust the coalition, that's for sure. But also, we need always to keep one eye open on the opposition, because we don't know. First of all, they don't control the situation. They rarely speak in our demonstrations. In Tel Aviv, they never speak, uh, because we are the one that moving that forward, mass amount of people. So we have a trust because we don't, as you can say, but uh, before you talked about the polls, so I will just translate it to the sentiment that we have. We don't trust far-right uh, fascist representative. We don't want them. The majority of Israeli people do not want a um, Jewish uh, supremacy in Israel. We don't believe it. On my shirt, you see it. Mm. You see democracy for all in Hebrew, Arabic, and, and English, because we still believe, even though they try to erase the Arabic language from Israel, we still want democracy for everyone. Mm. And uh, we don't want those settlers 
inside the government. This is what we shout and we chant in the streets, that we don't want homophobic, racist, um, fascists in the Knesset and in the government. And I think that we deserve better than this government. We deserve a government that works for us. And let me, let, let's remember, we are in the middle of the Middle East, mm -hmm. in crisis, in our neighbors, with Iran, with different countries. So it's not like, you know, we talk about Poland and Hungary. We are not in the middle of Europe. Yes. Israel is an island state. I, 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 am, I, am a gay, I am a gay man. If they, I don't know, they decide to persecute gays, where should I go? To Egypt? Mm -hmm. To Syria? To Lebanon? If they close down the airport, where should I go? To the sea? So we are really threatened and we are really afraid, but this is what makes us know that we so, have to go to the streets. We I, don't have any other option I want now. to bring Jeremy in never. here, because you're talking very much about the right and the left in Israeli politics, and it, it's obvious now that Netanyahu is at the left of his coalition, and it seems that he's almost lost his ability to play parties off against each other because he is so far at the left of that coalition. And, uh, Jeremy, you were talking earlier about Benny Gantz. It does seem that he's now more popular than Netanyahu. Uh, do you think, despite everything that Netanyahu has already survived, can he survive this? I, I mean, like I said, I think we'll find out in May. We have two very big things happening. One is, again, uh, the first uh, no-confidence motions when we come back from the recess. We have to see if what came out from the talks from the president's residence is something that still both his right-wing coalition as well as the uh, center and left-wing opposition parties are willing to live with. And then the second thing is the state budget, which comes up at the end of May. If uh, Netanyahu fails to pass the state budget um, in the final reading by the end of the month, that triggers an automatic election within 90 days. So those are v two very big uh, landmarks and challenges that Netanyahu needs to face in May. What are we going to be seeing until then? I think, again, we're going to be focused in terms of what's happening behind the closed doors of the president's residence. Over the last three months, we've had um, public debate within the Knesset Constitution Committee. Many people have viewed it as a little bit of a circus. Mm -hmm. It's been very difficult the actual content going there. It's going to now move to closed doors, and most Israelis are going to hope that there is something that comes out of it Indeed. for Netanyahu, again, play this game where we'll have both to see sides what happens. happy. Indeed. We'll have to see what emerges from those closed doors in the coming weeks. We'll have to leave it there, I'm afraid. But thank you to all of our guests, Yaniv Segal, Elisa Pavia and Jeremy Sultan. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see this program again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Remember, you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nastasia Tay, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.